the corpus of the Areopagite is is extremely mystical. Uh, in a way, it's it's Neoplatonic. No one argues about that. And and Thomas is fascinated about it. He wrote a whole commentary on the divine names, um, which I don't think yet is available in English, but I, I've studied it in Latin. And in this, we see that the mystical life is a participation, and we find the threefold way, the purgative, the illuminative, and the unitive. And you talk about this all the time, Dan, and I, I want to give you time to elaborate on it. But Thomas says, drawing on Dionysius, he says, if you're going to be a deacon, you must be on the purgative way. No one who's not in the purgative way can become a deacon. Right. In order to be a presbyter, a priest, you must be on the illuminative way. And then he says, no man should be chosen amongst the deacons or priests to become a bishop if he's not on the unitive way. This is Thomas Aquinas. That, that's, this means and every that's, single man in the USCCB should be in the unitive way if we were if we were Thomistic in the way we approach holy orders. Can you imagine the <laughs> church if the Episcopal was on the too. unitive way? Now, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll pass the mic to you, Dan. You talk about purgative illuminative yeah. and unitive way because it's very important and, and surprisingly like you said a lot of catholics don't know about this but it's the very heart of what it means to be a catholic yeah just the simplest understanding is is in the purgative way what we're doing is fighting against sin and somebody who exits from the purgative way the primary uh, de uh, uh reality in the soul is no habitual sin anymore right. no habitual mortal sin and no habitual venial sin of course, there's a constant practice of mental prayer and the progress in prayer. But the easiest one is there's no uh, habitual sin. So what, what Thomas is saying— I think particularly, say, Thomas, there's no mortal sin in the purgative way. Right. Yeah. Right. I would, I, when you said that, that's what I would have expected. Yes. Now, what I'm not saying is there's no mortal or venial. I'm saying there's no habitual. Right. Habitual mortal sin. Which is sin. different because you can commit a venial sin, uh, not very likely mortal, up in the illuminative and unitive ways. But— you know, the illuminative way is, 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 is the realm of you know, virtue exploding in the life of the believer, and, and it's the contemplative life it emerges late purgative and then to the illuminative and beyond, and the unitive is, is canonizable territory. So Thomas wants all of our bishops to be saints. Right. I couldn't agree more of that to high order, but I think certainly that, that idea, uh, that, that framework is, is, is uh, not understood and known. And it's not understood and known typically by most priests, most laity, that uh, the spiritual, you, you know, you're not supposed to uh, live in, in, indefinitely with sin. I heard a really good right. priest one time, a friend of mine, say, I, I went to confession and I confessed the same thing I've confessed for the last 20 years. And I thought, oh, dear Lord, you know, please help him, help him to find some, you know, some way to see that that's not your calling for him. He's a good priest. He's, yeah. you know, he's fighting a good fight. But anyway, where else do you want to go? Yeah, you know, because because Dionysius and, and Thomas are saying you, you can't give what you don't have. Right. And so, you know, the deacon is there to assist the priest, to prepare yeah. the catechumens, basically yeah. to do the old evangelization, which was gather catechumens, have exorcisms over them, teach them, you know, the creed and, and the basics of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. So that was the deacons. So what are the deacons doing? They're purging people. They're bringing right. people from paganism to the catechumenate, yep. to baptism, to the life of grace, to the Eucharist. Yep. So if they're, if the deacons are purging, they need to be already on the purgative way, or how are they going to instruct people to come That's in? Exactly and then the right. priests by administering the sacraments, they're the ones illuminating people and giving them the light through baptism, through uh, the whole Eucharist, et cetera. Yep. And confession, of course. And then the bishops, a bishop, you know, we hear our bishop saying, you know, well, we're all about the unity. We don't want to break the unity. Well, the unity that we have as Christians on earth is based on our union with God. Otherwise, there will the be no unity down here. And That's so right. if the bishops are supposed to be communicating unity in the church, they need to be on the unitive way in partaking of the divine, you know, nature of Christ and be, have this really deep mystical union. So Thomas is drawing on Dionysius, who it's a Pauline idea as well. It's an Old Testament idea that they, these bishop, priests, and deacons are communicating down into the world 
these graces and these realities because they're already in those three levels. Right. And so, and that's and, what makes holy orders work. If you're a right. bishop and you're just constantly in mortal sin, how are you going to bring about unity amongst the church? And how are you going to bring souls into union with God? It's not going to happen. Exactly. That was that was really well said. The other thing, I just a side note on un unity, and I'd like to speak to the our you know folks who are living in the nervous nervous ordo realm. Um, it, when you're told to adopt postures and a, an approach to the Eucharist that are contrary to church teaching uh, for the sake of unity no priest can make you sin no priest can make you do something against the magisterium that is a false notion that's crept in even among faithful novus ordo priests i just want to make a note about that there is no such thing as unity around false teaching there is or only false unity practice. or false practice mm -hmm. there's only unity so you know uh yeah, I, I, don't, I we don't have to go into that uh, in, any further. But you know, if you're being told, you know, hold hands at the Our Father because everyone else do does it, you need to either you know find a, a faithful parish or you know get ready for a holy battle and and deal with that and right. don't do that. Um, if you're told you can't kneel to receive communion, uh, you, you know, uh, I, you yeah. <laughs> It's that's a you need to kneel to receive communion regardless of the consequences. It, it, it's a false it's false teaching to say that you need to do what everybody else is doing if they're going against the magisterium. And and you know this is a touchy point because of course the USCCB yep. allows for both postures. But in my in our community, our what we teach is, and, and we have people in the Latin Mass and people in No, no Sordo. Um, we teach you if there's an option you always choose the most humble the most reverent so always on your knees always always with humility always recognizing the true body blood soul and divinity of Christ and that no one can make you do something contrary to what it means to to humbly kneel before the Lord so we need to do that and you shouldn't be receiving in the hand that's a whole nother issue but amen